Hi, everyone. Welcome. If this is your first time joining us um, as the Maryland Historical Society virtual program, we're so excited that you're here. If it's not your first time and you joined us last week, um, thanks for coming back. We're working really hard to provide you with new virtual programs each week. So please continue to check out our website and social media for the latest in virtual programming from us at the Maryland Historical Society. Today, we are utilizing Zoom webinars to produce this program. In an effort to run a smooth live experience, your audio and video capabilities have been removed. You are, however, still able to engage with us during the program by using the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. By clicking on the three dots above the text box, you can choose who to send your message to. Give it a try. Type in your first name and tell everyone where you are watching from today. We also are encouraging you to ask questions for both our guests and for your hosts, myself and Margot, at any time during the next hour by clicking the Q&A icon, also located at the bottom of your screen. A box will appear and you can type in your question. We'll select several questions for a guest to answer at the end of her talk. We also want to let you know that this program is being recorded and it will be made available to you to rewatch in the next few days. We'll communicate the release of the video to you in a follow-up email and through our social media outlets. This evening, we are hosting our first virtual happy hour, Marvelous Style, how fashion defines characters in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I am one of your hosts, Margot Copera, Public Programs Manager at the Maryland Historical Society, as well as my partner, Martha Osterbiel, the museum's Community Engagement Manager. Our happy hour program today will take us on a retro deep dive into how real 1950s designs were reinterpreted and how Maryland native Claire McArdle served as that go-to inspiration for modern women in the Amazon Prime video series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Since we are providing a socially acceptable reason to be drinking early on a Thursday, I hope that all of you have your own 1950s era cocktail in hand. Mine is a pink squirrel, a popular almond flavor drink of the 1950s. And Martha, what are you drinking today? I am drinking an old fashioned. Since it's almost happy hour, I think we should challenge our audience to play a little drinking game throughout the program. What do you think, Margo? That's a really good idea, Martha. Let's so every time you hear one of the following words, take a sip. The words are couture, Claire McArdle, costume, and icon. We'll also post these words in the chat feed to help you out. So throw a few more ice cubes into that highball glass, kick back on the sofa, and let's introduce our guest today, who, when is not closely examining a historical dress or conceiving of the next exhibition, can be found sipping local drinks in Frederick in an easy 1950s shirtwaist dress or chasing after her kids. Welcome, Allison Tolman, Vice President of Collections at the Maryland Historical Society. Hi guys. I am wearing a 1950s shirt dress, so I'm not chasing my children now for once. <laughs> Allie has a background in conservation and art history, and her love for the preservation and interpretation of social history are united in the fashion archives at the Maryland Historical Society. And through this appreciation grew her love for vintage dresses. So Allie alluded that of what she's wearing today. And Allie, what are you drinking? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I jumped the gun, but yes, I'm wearing a 1950s uh, vintage dress. Uh, this one has a, has a nice surplus top that you get on a lot of shirtwaist dress. Uh, I think it's homemade, maybe from a sample. Uh, you could buy patterns and then make your own based on the way this one's been done. My guess is handmade, but it's really lovely and playful and I love it. 
I am drinking champagne. Uh, <laughs> um, Maisel drinks champagne sometimes before she goes on stage, especially in season three. So it seemed really fitting for me to drink champagne. <laughs> and um, that's a good segue. Ali, why did you decide to explore the topic of Mrs. Maisel? So uh, I was actually, when I was preparing for the Spectrum of Fashion exhibit at the Maryland Historical Society, I had someone come in for a behind the scenes tour and we were talking about fashion and it was really interesting because some of the looks that I had seen on the show, I also saw in our own collection. And I thought that was really amazing. So that got me really interested in this topic particularly. And can you share what your favorite scene is in the series? Uh, all of them. <laughs> There's one really fantastic one when they're packing for the Catskills and it's Midge and Rose and they're trying to, you know, uh, Abe has a little, uh, as kids toys almost, but they're not kids toys. And he's trying to fit everything into a U-Haul and they have to have four picnic dresses each. It's amazing. <laughs> I know that scene well and um, it is fabulous. Um, with that being said, I think we will turn the controls over to you. Um, okay. And we are thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Sure. Welcome again to everyone. Uh, welcome to Marvelous Style, how fashion defines characters in the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. We are so glad that you're able to join us virtually. You know, I had really wanted to give this talk in person so that I could pull examples from the fashion archives at the Maryland Historical Society, you know, so you, I could show you the simply perfect A-line of a Christian Dior coat or let you see up close the impeccable construction of a Claire McArdle gown. But say la vie, I'm just happy I get to bring this to you and share in the fun fashion of the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. So I love this show, might be an understatement. I mean, it's smart, it's funny, it's got a strong female lead and it's got some of the most beautiful fashion in every scene. Sadly though, I have to watch this by myself. Not because my husband doesn't enjoy shows with a strong female lead. I mean, after all, he did marry me, but because he grew tired of me pausing the show and running up and saying, look at this perfect example of a Claire McArdle gown. It's so brilliant. It's a near copy of the one at FIT. And of course, it's a flashback when it would have been at the height of fashion. And she's a rebel, she's modern, she's dyed her hair blonde. How smart is this? I would do that about five, 10 times an episode, and he thought it was a distraction. So now I have to watch it by myself. But thankfully, I have all of you here to revel in the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. So the focus of the talk is just what I was talking about, you know, showing how specific designers, colors, and clothing are used to deftly inform us about the characters, motives, and mindsets. I'll do a brief background on what was happening in the world of fashion in the 1950s, and then I'll talk about Donna Zakowska, the costume designer of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And I'll get into the good stuff, you know, breaking down the clothing of different characters on the show. I'm gonna focus on Midge and Rose uh, because they have some of the most really fabulous transformation throughout the three seasons, and you can see it in their clothing. So let's get started. As World War II ends, fashion explodes. I mean, breaking free from the bonds of wartime rationing. Christian Dior makes a monumental debut in 1947 with his new look, which threw off the utilitarian style of the decade prior and issued in an era of highly tailored looks for women. The new look featured a rounded shoulder, almost impossibly narrow waist, and accentuated the hips. He also brings about the age of the cocktail dress. As middle-class America begins to gain in wealth and status, evening cocktail parties at the home become trendy and you need a dress for every occasion. I mentioned the picnic dress, or maybe you have a cabana jacket, an evening dress, a day dress, and of course, you need a cocktail dress. Movies and television made a massive impact on fashion in the 1950s. When Princess Elizabeth marries Philip, BBC broadcast it to 200 million people around the world. And when she becomes queen, everyone continues to watch her style and the style of the royal family. On the silver screen, Grace Kelly and Audrey Hepburn float by in Parisian couture lookalikes, and sometimes straight up haute couture pieces. Grace Kelly then goes and marries the Prince of Monaco in a wedding dress that is likely one of the most iconic of the 20th century. Also, the teenager becomes a new type of culture. Rock and roll and rebellious movies strike a chord with young adults who are staying home longer than earlier generations. 
So blue jeans, leather coats, and devil may care attitudes become a calling card for American teens. While the hourglass shape is iconic in the 1950s, a range of silhouettes is actually pretty expansive. I mean, Dior, we think of the new look in the 1950s, even though it's late 40s, but in 53, he follows up with a slim H line, and then in 55 with the A line and the Y line. I mean, each of these silhouettes, aside from the A line, are touted a much slimmer silhouette, you know, tight through the hips. American designers, too, found a an eager audience. Claire McCardle, she created the American look, or she's credited with creating the American look in the 1940s, you know, providing chic wear for the modern American woman who needed useful, wearable fashions that looked as stunning as the Parisian fashions. So not only did she create stunning evening wear, but pedal pushers, ballet flats, cat eye sunglasses, everyday dresses that could be comfortable and beautiful. In 1955, when Dior is putting out his A-line and Y-line looks, McCardle in the USA becomes one of three fashion designers to ever grace the cover of Time magazine. She's also featured in Life magazine. So the green and yellow dress that you see in this slide from the collection of the Maryland Historical Society is featured in Life magazine in a spread with artists of the time. So the print of this dress was designed by Marc Chagall. Pablo, Pablo Picasso also did a print and the models would wear these dresses in the artist studio with Claire McCardle. Sadly, the end of the 1950s, it is marred with tragedy. McCardle and Dior both die young, and they leave huge holes and question marks in the fashion scene. As the decade ends, new fashion icons begin to step forward. You know, everyone's looking for who to look at to who, what, you know, what they should wear. And then Jacqueline Kennedy, Jackie O, she starts catching the eye as her husband runs for president of the United States. And Barbie, the Barbie doll, makes her first appearance marketed as a teenage fashion model. A big part of why movies dictated fashion in the 1950s is because of Edith Head. She's the woman sitting next to Audrey Hepburn in the one image. The eight-time Emmy winner had an astounding career creating some of the most memorable looks in film. Her work with Alfred Hitchcock, dressing Grace Kelly in Rear Window and To Catch a Thief, Kim Novak in Vertigo, Doris Day and The Man Who Knew Too Much. I mean, she created these beautiful damsels in distress. Her close work with Audrey Hepburn in Robin Holiday in 1953, Sabrina in 1954, and Funny Face in 1957 defined fashion for droves of young women. And while Hepburn would say that whenever she was in film, she was wearing Givenchy, Head certainly had a lot to do with creating her look. Head um, also created even more iconic looks. So if none of these looks rings a bell. If you don't remember Grace Kelly's dress from Rear Window that you see here, I have a feeling you all do. But if you look into the 1960s, she also designed Tippi Hedren's look in Birds, the green skirt suit, uh, and Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's. I mean, these are looks that are still replicated today. Men too become style icons. Uh, by this time, Prince Edward has already begun to popularize a more relaxed fit for menswear. But in the 1950s, new styles, especially for young adults, start popping up in movies. Marlon Brando made blue jeans and a leather coat, a staple for young men in the, in the wild one. And James Dean romanticized rebellion in Rebel Without a Cause, and then further solidified his place in Hollywood fame with his early death a year later. And finally, Elvis Presley swooned a nation with The Jailhouse Rock in 1957. Donna Zakowska is a Brooklyn-based designer who is Emmy nominated for her work in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and who has previously won an Emmy for her work in creating historical costume in 2008's John Adams. She's the woman here uh, standing with Rachel Brosnahan. She also won an award for excellence in period television by the Costume Designers Guild. Zakowska credits her success to countless hours of research into the many facets of fashion to the time she's trying to create. And while many of the looks in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel are designed and made by Zakaska, they're often inspired by real designs and patterns from the late 1950s. I mean, Zakowska probably has every copy of Vogue from the mid-1950s to the mid-1960s. She studied vintage copies of Vogue and historical fashions from costume collections uh, like the Maryland Historical Society, the Costume Institute, the Kyoto Costume Institute, FIT. I mean, to create looks for character, she's looking at real designs. And for extras and day players, she sometimes uses real vintage pieces. Color 
is also a huge role in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Sikowska really uses color to show emotions of characters throughout the seasons. You can watch their transformation through the hue, shade, and tone in which characters dress over the span of the seasons. Now, one of the great things about The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is the diverse world that Midge is a part of. I mean, she has a very traditional Upper West Side parent, uh, parents really. Her manager from the artsy village runs a club full of beatnik acts, including slam poetry or three acoustic guitars on stage. Then there's the rising middle class, that new money world of Joel and his parents. And season three especially, we get that Hollywood world of Shy Baldwin. And finally, the modern American working women who are just trying to survive on their own income. The many different social and economic classes, the personalities, and of course the fashion of Mrs. Maisel's world uh, makes the show so wonderfully dynamic. So I'd like to talk fashion and Abe Weissman, played by Tony Shalhoub. Not where you think I'd go, right? But Abe is so great. I mean, he doesn't prioritize fashion. He packs one suitcase to every four of Midge and Rose, but he knows fashion. He knows that Bell Labs is different from Columbia and that he should look different. Even if it means changing pants in a taxi cab, he gets it, you know? He knows that clothing tells other people who you are. And we, we know that, right? We know that when we're putting something on for the day, it's telling the outside world something about us. Of course, right now, most of our clothes probably say, help me, I'm trapped inside of my house with my children and I can't get out. But they're still saying something, so, and he knows that. Uh, Abe, like his wife and daughter, also knows how to play the part. Sure, his natural state is brown tweed and sweaters, but he can fit in whether at Columbia, in Paris, vacationing at the Catskills, or holding a beatnik party in his apartment. I mean, no matter what he's wearing, you can characterize his style as reserved, tidy, and also kind of relaxed. I mean, this is how we see Abe's confidence, built, built on his own intelligence, exude in his clothing. He's also one of the very few characters who isn't afraid to stand out, and he will sit in a dive bar in his brown tweed or he will go to a fancy hotel in a Polynesian shirt and shorts. This shows his confidence, his authority in everything he does, the confidence to stand out, even though others may look at him, but the confidence that he exudes while wearing it. I also wanted to talk about Moish and Shirley Maisel because they represent a big part of American culture during the 1950s. They are new money, the rising middle class. They have the income equal to those of the Upper West Side but they don't have that old school decorum that comes with generations of posterity. They stand out and you can see that in their clothing. I mean, look at Shirley in this image. She loves bright colors, bold patterns, and super trendy fashions. You know, Moish is a clothing manufacturer. So they know what is supposed to be the next trend, what is going to be showing wealth, uh, more expensive pieces. And they like to show that they know. So even if that means that Shirley has to wear a fur coat all day, all night, during the summer, at a beach resort, Shirley will wear her beacon of wealth and fashion knowledge. She also does really over-the-top versions, like the most ostentatious versions of fashion. Not only is she wearing her fur coat for all occasions, but her hat in this scene is a take on Dior's Cooley hat, introduced in, with the new look and taking Eastern inspiration. Dior's coolie, though, uh, is plain, and Shirley has massive berries and leaves on hers. You know, everything is loud with the Maisel's fashion, and it tells you that they are screaming at the wealthy elite, that they are here in their world, they belong because they also have money, and they are proud of the money they that they made, so they are not afraid to stand out. Uh, one last character I want to talk about before I get to Midge and Rose is Susie Meyerson played by Alex Borstein. She is the anti-Midge when it comes to fashion. If you were to try and name her style icon, it would be Marlon Brando, as you see on this slide. Susie wears menswear, from the cut of the pants to the leather jacket to the newsy cap. And so around this time, there are what are called teddy boys and Judites who play at wearing over-the-top menswear and biker styles. But that's not Susie. I mean, there's no glitz to Susie's style. She's not wearing a tape 
on a man's leather coat. She's wearing a man's leather coat. So what does this say about her? Well, Susie is trying to make it in a man's world. I mean, she runs a bar and she wants to be a manager for a comedian. These are not women's jobs in the 1950s. She's making a conscious choice to wear menswear so she fits in and gets the same authority by being perceived as a man. I mean, think about it. The only people who realize that Susie is not a man when they meet her is Midge and Abe. I mean, she's also brash and vulgar and pushy. She's the opposite of what the ideal 1950s woman is supposed to be. And I think that plays into her idea of what a man would be, the opposite of a woman. Her style is very subversive, is very challenging, and it is very Susie. So let's talk Midge Maisel. Clothing is important on and off the stage in Midge's life. She's a modern American woman, and she's one wearing very high-end fashion pieces. Fashion is so important to Midge because she feels the need to be perfect at everything. Perfect wife, perfect daughter, perfect saleswoman, perfect everything. I mean, she wants to be the Vogue version of everything in her life. So Zakowska created a wide, wide range of looks for Midge so she could shine uh, in that diverse world that we talked about. She also uses color a lot with Midge, particularly pink, to give her viewers a clue into her mind. When we first meet Midge, we see a great example of how she changes her appearance to be perfect all the time. Her exhaustive bedtime routine, I mean, waiting for her husband to fall asleep, to take off her makeup and curl her hair, and then resetting it all before he wakes up. Perfect wife, right? She's got her perfect pink housewife dress in this one image, and then her perfect little pink getup with the scarf when she goes to the village. She's in this little bubble where everything is kind of picture perfect. Uh, of course, the bubble quickly pops when Joel leaves. So how does Midge find her perfect look? Oftentimes, it's copying Audrey Hepburn. I mean, Hepburn is a clear style icon for Midge, uh, even her wedding dress, which in the show, I believe she says she wanted to look like Grace Kelly. The veil, though, is a direct copy from the one that uh, is worn in Funny Face by Audrey Hepburn. And her little beatnik getup, that's Audrey Hepburn in Funny Face as well. It's often like if a magazine were to do an article and have a how to get that artsy look in your wardrobe, that's what she's doing. I mean, it's almost costumey at times. And the magazine or TV version of real life, but real life in a TV show. And it makes sense for her character because she isn't really these things. She's not a beatnik. She's playing a character, just like Audrey Hepburn in her movie. The list goes on and on with Midge playing dress up in her life. In the upper left, Midge is going on a plane for the very first time. She doesn't know what to wear on a transatlantic flight. So what does she do? A take on a flight attendant. I mean, look at the perfectly little hat perched just so on her head. She's got her matching gloves, her coordinated dress, purse, coat, everything matches. And just below that, that's her boating outfit. I mean, that's what she calls it. It's my boating outfit. Uh, in another part of the scene, you actually see the men working on the sailboat and she matches them. She fits in. I mean, it's a playful take on what sailors wear because again, if you want to be perfect nautical, you look like someone who looks natural on a boat. Even when she works at the Altman's, Midge is playing the part of the modern working women. I mean, think about it. Her parents were surprised when she went to work. I don't think they assumed that she was going to do anything with that money. And Midge just says that she gets money and she spends it. I mean, it's not really until later that she has an income. It's just playing. The difference between Midge and the people she works with is that she might own a lot more of the fashion at home. She's got Dior in her closet. I mean, she tones down her vibrant look to grays and muted colors to fit in. But even here and her beautifully silk tailored dress and over the top bow, she looks much more expensive than anyone else in the scene. And finally, she kicks off the shy, the shy Baldwin tour with this USO performance, um, showing up at the barracks in a couture army getup. I mean, she's got this red, white, and blue tassel on her hat. She's got what looks like jodhpurs and this amazingly tailored bomber jacket. And then she goes on stage at a USO performance. So who would she mimic? 
Marilyn Monroe. Because if you're going to be on stage at a USO performance and you want to be perfect, who do you imitate but Marilyn Monroe? I mean, she even gets that shifty wind blowing up the skirt moment like Monroe. And if you're wondering who Midge is pretending to be at the onset of the show, here's a photo of Midge doing her nightly routine on one side and Rose on the other. Inevitably, Midge looks to her mother for guidance on how to be perfect throughout her life. She is a role model. She is the icon of wealth and perfection. Pink is incredibly important in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. This slideshow is an ode to the love of pink that Midge has in this show. I mean, it's her iconic color. It's Midge pink. Zakowska uses pink to show when Midge is sliding back into her old lifestyle, when she is playing the perfect daughter or wife role. And she also uses it to show change in Midge, you know. You can see when she starts to feel emotional towards someone or start to like something because you'll see pink pop up in her wardrobe. I will show a couple of examples here. In the iconic We've Got the Rabbi uh, scene, it's very early in the season, uh, season one, episode one, I believe. Uh, she's wearing her perfectly pink midge outfit. It's a great moment for her. The rabbi has forgiven her and she's got the pink dress, coat, gloves, hat. Everything's pink. Everything's perfect. Everything is midge. Now, I talked about when she's sliding back into her traditional life. So in this scene, the little flight attendant scene, it's when she and Abe are about to go get Rose from Paris. And what it represents is that her world is fracturing. As much as she tries to break out and be on her own and be her own person, she loves her family bubble. She loves her parents as they are. She does not want that to change. And so when she starts sliding back into that, you'll see pink pop up. And emotion. Benjamin, played by Zachary Levi. Uh, when, you, when she first meets Benjamin, she is not in pink. And then as she starts to appreciate him more, you'll see pink pop up more and more. Here again, iconic Midge Pink, this time Bathing Suit Edition. And notice she's reading Vogue, of course. This is right after Joel leaves. She's going for a walk with Imogene. And again, she's clinging to her former life. You know, she, even when she goes to the exercise, she's wearing pink because she doesn't want to be the divorcee. She still wants to be Midge. And this is the first time she gets in a car with Benjamin. It's very light pink, showing flirtation. Again, her parents come to visit her in Florida. We have a great pink sundress. This is her when she moves home, playing the daughter. And finally, when Midge is at the Apollo, we get that beautiful Midge pink. I should say that I'm only covering pink here in this show, but there is meaning behind every color. And maybe we can get into that in Q&A if you want to know what a certain color means, because they do all have certain meanings. But pink is definitely the prominent one for this show. So clearly, there is a lot of fashion I could uncover in this talk. I'm going to focus on three designers that Zakowska uses to divine Midge's style and character. These three are Claire McCardle, Jacques Fott, and Christian Dior. So I mentioned before, Donna Zakowska did a lot of research into the fashion world of the 1950s. She knows what it means to put a woman in a Claire McCardle dress. She knows how to fit it into her wardrobe and what that is saying about the person who's wearing it. I mean, Claire McCardle was this rare American designer. You know, she refused to go to Paris to copy runway looks. And that's what most American labels are doing at that time. They're sending their designers to Paris to copy runway looks or to get toiles, patterns for Parisian fashions to bring them back to America and then to make them in America so they can sell, sell them for a cheaper price point. Claire doesn't do that. Instead, she stays true to her own aesthetic, featuring wearable clothing and sometimes even washable clothing that the modern American woman could be comfortable in while still looking amazing. Now, I could go on and on and on and on and on and on about Claire McCardle. She is a Maryland-born designer and we love her extra hard here. I recommend if you really want to get into Claire, and you should. Uh, the Spectrum of Fashion catalog actually has a wonderful essay in it written by curatorial volunteer Barbara Meager, and it covers Claire McCardle a lot more. So you should definitely check that out if you're interested in Claire. So Claire had very modern ideas to clothing, like putting closures to her dress on the side, like the one I'm wearing. And she did that because she thought that women should be able to dress themselves. Crazy, right? Now, during rationing in World War II, when zippers were restricted, she actually started using industrial fittings, grommets, to close her dresses. 
and this becomes a staple, like you see here in the dress from FIT. And this sort of style is one of the things that becomes what are called McCardalisms, or calling cards for Claire McCardle. Um, you can see if you pick up on certain things when you're seeing a Claire McCardle or Claire McCardle copy. Uh, the surplus top with the industrial fittings is definitely a McCardalism. Anytime really you see industrial fittings. Uh, she also would use yard long sashes, uh, like the green dress with the yellow belt we saw earlier, uh, so that you could set the waist where you want it. Uh, and then this flashback, if you look closely, you will see on the side that she has side closures with industrial fittings. And this is showing you that she is a housewife, but she's still a modern thinking housewife. I mean, this isn't a flashback. It's also one of the first things. So she's being that perfect housewife, but she's still showing she has a modern edge. Instead of the highly tailored looks of Dior, McArdle created dresses without a set waist. And she used big belts and those yard long sashes so that women of different styles and different shapes could wear the same design. She often created perfectly matched belts like you see on the dress from the Costume Institute at the Met. But it was made flexible, it wasn't attached. So it could be worn with your favorite belt like Midge has here. This is another early picture of Midge from the first episode. And what Zakaska is doing here is that right away, she's showing that while she is in the same world as her parents, she's still different. She's very differently thinking. And you can tell that through her clothing. McArdle was known for her sport and leisure looks. So of course, she's gonna make an appearance at the Catskills. Here, Midge is wearing a beautiful striped sundress with patch pockets and shorts underneath. So McArdle loves pockets, loves them. They're so useful, right? She said, men always look so comfortable with their hands in their pockets. Why can't women? I mean, so McArdle put pockets in everything and not just little fashionable pockets like we have on jeans sometimes, deep pockets. She gets them from uh, sportswear and she puts them in everything. Even her evening gowns have pockets, though usually hidden in the seams so that you can't see them from the outside. She also took big patch pockets of sportswear and put them on clothing like you see in Midge's dress here. Zakaska said that the striped dress uh, by McArdle was the inspiration for this look, but I think that this piece from the Kyoto Institute was also on her mind. The front opening of the skirt you see here is clearly replicated in the look that Midge is wearing. And if you look at her accessories, the sunglasses on her head and the purse in her hand, they also match Midge very closely. Jacques Fott is another designer that's worn by Midge. We know this because at one point, Rose asks if this particular dress is Dior, and Midge replies, no, it's Jacques Fott. Thank you, Midge, makes my job easy. Jacques Fott is one of the three big Parisian couture houses in the 40s and 50s. It's Dior, Balmain, and Fott. Of the three, Jacques Fott is known for dressing young, chic Parisians. He had daring necklines, sometimes paired with higher hemlines, uh, bold patterns, and uh, like the impressionist dress, dress that Midge is wearing here, or the bold plaid that we see on the model. He's most famous person that he dressed, well, he dressed Rita Hayworth in one of her mar marriages, uh, and he dressed Eva Perron. I say that's probably the most famous person to wear a Jacques Fott. So Fott had a playful way with patterns. Like here we see the plaid dress and I mean, could it be a closer copy to the one from the v a Museum from 1950? Look at the line, and this is a great example because they're kind of positioned the same way. If you look at the line of the dress and how the back is done, it's so genius, it is a great copy. And I have to say, I love the daring swathe of fabric that darts in and out of the chest. It's like creating scandalous attention, but she has a super high neckline. And here again, we see playful fabric darting in and out, both the historical example and the one created for Maisel. Midge is in the scene at an artist studio. So it makes sense that she's wearing an artistic haute couture dress, right? I mean, it's especially playful in Midge's because if you look closely, the fabric will dart in at the dress and it comes out in the matching bolero. And its exit is done exactly like the piece that you see in the historic, where it has like a little line pocket and it fans out. Much smaller, of course, but it is clearly a take on this. I mean, 
Spot is very cheeky and playful in his design, but he's still a powerhouse in haute couture. So when Midge is wearing it, she's saying, you know, she's aiming to impress, but also showing she's kind of playful and edgy. Makes sense when you're going to buy a very famous artist piece. The final designer I want to talk about with Midge is Christian Dior. Zakowska takes a lot of design influence from Dior. Dior is a trendsetter in silhouettes in the 1950s and also uses a lot of bold colors. And by wearing silhouettes, you know, that he says are in vogue, you're saying that you're in vogue. He had a flair for simple elegance, like here with this beautiful A-line coat, um, both at the v and Museum and on Midge. I mean, Midge in this scene is in Paris, so of course she wants to look like she belongs. She's gonna wear Parisian couture and certainly one that is infamous in, that, in Paris. Uh, the dress that she has underneath is actually another take on Dior uh, that she wears on stage. Dior is also the common ground for Midge and Rose. Here Midge is wearing a new look style gown borrowed from Rose's closet. She talks of the Dior with a sense of awe and Roe likes it because of the understated elegance of the designer, which of course sets Midge off. I mean, they like Dior for different reasons, but Dior is somehow the common ground for the two women. Well, I don't think all of her dresses are meant to be like she's wearing Dior all the time. I mean, she's wearing high-end dresses that look like Dior. Maybe it's a ready wear or something copy that's supposed to look like a Dior or doesn't exist, but takes influence from Dior. I mean, Mish is not as wealthy as her parents. Perhaps they're high-end American copies of Dior. We see his influence everywhere, though. I mean, here, this is a take on the Y line, which gave more volume to the shoulders, has that impossibly narrow waist, and is very tight through the hips. The highly tailored bodices and matching boleros are iconic of Dior. Uh, the hem of the jackets, of these shorter jackets, would always match exactly sitting at the waistline of the dress. So it looks like they're wearing a dress until you pay attention and when she moves, you'll see it slide up a little bit or she takes off the jacket. It's really impeccable the way that is tailored. One thing that I should mention that is in common uh, with all the three dresses, the three designers I've talked about, they're all dead by the time the show takes place. I mean, Jacques Fott dies in 1955. His wife continues it, but it dies out in 57. Christian Dior dies tragically in 57, very early. Uh, and McCardle dies in 1958. Dior's line will continue with Yves Saint Laurent, but Midge isn't wearing those fashions. She's not wearing anything from the trapeze line. She's wearing Dior's earlier stuff. Her style is mid fifties when it comes to couture. So what does that say about her? She's supposed to be fashionable, right? Well, again, let's think about her world. I mean, she had a lot more freedom when her parents were footing the bill, and she still is clinging to that old life a little bit. I think she finds comfort in these pieces, and it, it also recollects happier times. It also shows that she's clinging to that young, artsy, modern woman who is dyeing her hair blonde in college, you know, even though she has become a housewife and mother. Also, my guess is that a woman who has had two children and measures herself every night is probably pretty proud of the fact that she still fits into her pieces. And there's also the fact that this isn't the world of fast fashion that we live in now. Things lasted a lot longer and it wasn't really looked down on that you would be wearing the same clothes for years on end, especially women where you're proving that you can still fit. I mean, remember, Rose had that Dior gown. So let's talk Rose. She goes through so many different transformations in this show and you can all watch them through clothing. It's so beautifully and artfully done with the color uh, and tone with Rose. When we meet Rose, she's pretty simple as far as clothing. It's Chanel, Chanel, and more Chanel. I mean, Chanel actually opened early in the 20th century and then closes her couture house in 1939. Then she reopens post-war and she enters, re-enters the field and finds it dominated by men. Chanel doesn't follow modern aesthetics. She stays true to what she's known for. You know, looser fitted jackets and skirt suits with braiding, some gilding, a set of pearls. This is because it's the go-to and it, it becomes the go-to for women of wealth and leisure like Rose. It's also, I, I would think that the longevity of the line probably makes Rose trust her taste. I mean, Zakaska does a pretty good Chanel adaptation, you have to admit. I mean, if you look here, this is from Life magazine in 1961. 
Can't you imagine Rose just walking down the street with these women? She would fit in perfect. Again, here we are, Chanel and pearls. Rose is pretty predictable early on. One thing I do love about Rose is her hats. Beth Turvin is amazing. I mean, hats in the 1950s are usually pretty close to the head, like a toque, uh, and younger women don't even wear hats. That's because, so oddly, during the war, milliners are one of the few people who don't have restrictions. So you, we get some pretty crazy hats paired with these very simple, austere looks. And then in the 1950s, it flips. Uh, we get some hats. You know, we have the coolie hat, the cartwheel hat, um, and turbans, like the piece here on Rose. But they do, and so they do add some flair, but it's certainly a much simpler take. And certainly with older women, you will find hats. Again, here's another great copy of Chanel. And beige, like Chanel. Chanel stayed away from the bold colors of other de designers, especially the bold colors of Dior. And she ushered in the age of beige. You know, champagne and peach, that's Chanel, and that's Rose in season one. So Rose goes through this beautiful transformation between season one and season two. And you can tell because there's a drastic shift in color. I mean, here in the bottom on the left, she's in yet another beige Chanel number. And uh, then we see her here at the end of the season. It's darker brown. Uh, it's when she finds out that Abe has been keeping things from her. Midge is, you know, comedian. It's craziness. She starts to, her world starts cracking. Then she goes to Paris. It's like, who is this woman, right? She's wearing really dark colors. You know? And then we get deep purples, jewel-toned coats, and Dior silhouettes. I mean, she ushers in the new age of Rose. When she returns to the U.S., she brings that jewel tone back with her. And then the last scene, not only isn't she in a bright, bold plaid with vibrant yellow, but if you look closely, and in another scene you can see it a little better, you see that surplus top and the side closure. Yeah, there's industrial fittings on that side. She's wearing a take on a McArdle, and you can even see that perfectly matched belt like we saw with the halter. Her infatuation with McArdle continues in the Catskills. So here she is in this lovely green wrap dress. And we actually have a similar version in the Maryland Historical Society's collection. The piece in the middle, that's an evening wear dress. Uh, I think it's for, if I remember correctly, it's the opening night, right? And if you notice Midge in the scene, see her in that pink number? She's clinging to old life. She's being the good daughter. She wants her old Catskill life. But Midge, Midge is in an evening gown. That is a clear take on this Claire McArdle gown. And finally, the bird watching outfit. So if you see there's an oversized lapel and it's a wrap that has this really great sash that wraps all the way around. It's a clear take on this piece right here. So she starts wearing McArdle. Of course, McArdle is still very expensive at the time. So it's still very high end, very wealthy. It's just not French. It, so it's slightly modern in that take. Also, she was the queen when it came to sportswear, so it's the perfect place to wear McArdle. But I think on Rose, it's really trying to show you that she is shedding her past a little bit. Both Midge and Rose go through drastic changes between the first two seasons. I mean, we can see it here in Midge, but look at Rose. I mean, we remember the Chanel girl from the season one, look at her here. She's in a stunningly bold Dior wrap top and cape. Cape, the beautiful Y-line silhouette, a toque hat, beautifully bold, still elegant. Of course, season three happens. Uh, so season three, Rose wakes up from her dream world where she was an art artist and a student. She starts to miss that comfort of her trust fund, right? She realizes that she loved her old life. <laughs> And we see a quick retreat into pastels. But there's a little change. No beige, no Chanel. She's somewhere in between old and new. And in the last scene in season three, which you see in the floral dress, you know, she's decided she's going to make her own money and earn her way back into that wealthy world with money she's made. You know, she's got this playful print. She has a youthful cut. And she has a really playful take on pearls. So finally, I thought that we should talk about fashion defining the eponymous Mrs. Maisel. Midge has trouble deciding what her role is when she to play on stage. There's no Vogue article on how to dress like a female comedian. 
because there's no female comedians. I mean, sure, there are those who play characters who have a shtick like Sophie Lennon, but no one is going up there and doing what she does, being herself. So she struggles. She starts to wear this beatnik look that we saw in the beginning. Then she has a couple of playful takes with pants, you know, a playful take on menswear, wearing pants on stage. And then she starts wearing separates. Uh, she'll bring in some couture pieces. We see the take on the Jacques Plot, but it's very toned down. Uh, and then at the end of season one, it seems like she's found her own look, right? Not quite. It's another take on Aubrey Hepburn, this time from Sabrina. But really, this is done because the marvelous Mrs. Maisel is supposed to be a little wink at real life comedian Joan Rivers who is known for wearing black dresses and pearls on stage. Though personally, I think in this case, Zakaska got a little closer to Audrey Hepburn than to Joan Rivers. The black dress becomes the calling card for Mrs. Maisel on stage in many different iterations and shapes. But toward the end of season three, we actually start to get some color in her onstage looks. We have these amazing pink feathers at the hem of her dress. And on another one, she's wearing the green swath of fabric that goes kind of racing through the dress. And, you know, it's finally like Midge is beginning to sneak into Mrs. Maisel or that she's beginning to accept that Mrs. Maisel and Midge are intertwined. And in the last episode, we get pink, pink on stage, iconic Midge pink. It's bright, it's loud, it's got pockets, it's Midge and it's Mrs. Maisel. And to cap it all off, we see Midge outside the Apollo in her all pink ensemble, a callback to Way Out the Rabbi from season one, but entirely new. So that's all I have for you guys. Thank you so much for coming and listening to the talk. I'm gonna turn it back over to Martha and to Marga. Thank you, Allie. That was wonderful. I'm so glad you wow. liked it. Wow, you just bumped binge watching the series. <laughs> and who doesn't want to wear a McCardle dress in quarantine? <laughs> it is comfortable and it does have pockets. That's the important part. Absolutely. Now that we have gotten our audience maybe a little tipsy, let's play a quick game of guess who wore it. <laughs> so, Ali, you made several connections to garments in the Spectrum of Fashion exhibition that's currently on view at the Maryland Historical Society when you were analyzing Midge and Rose's fashion style. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to place a few images of garments that are in the fashion archive up on the screen one at a time. And we're going to ask our audience to vote on who from the marvelous Mrs. Maisel would wear it. And then- I love it. <laughs> if you would please describe what that piece of clothing is and um, tell us if we're right or if we're wrong. All right, so I am going to share our first image. This is our first image and I am going to ask you all to vote. Who would wear it, Midge or Rose? And Ali, if you can describe what this gown is and, um, and in just a moment, I'll close the voting and you can tell us the answer. Sure, so I talked about this one in the slideshow. This is a shirt waist dress made by Claire McCardle. The print was actually designed by Marc Chagall, and then the printed fabric was made into dresses by Claire McCardle. She also does this with Pablo Picasso. It's a cotton dress, uh, buttons down the front with little pearls, and it has this wool sash that you can wrap around the waist as many times as you want to change the style to fit your own personality. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to end this poll, and it looks like the results are in. 62% of us think that Midge, Midge would have worn it, and we have a 38% think that Rose would wear it. Allie, what mm. So I would say probably Midge. I mean, I know they both wear McCardle, but Midge is probably the only one we would see in a shirtwaist dress. I mean, 
you don't really see rose in that sort of hourglass shape a lot. So Mike, I would say Mitch. All right, here's the next one. And we're gonna relaunch this poll. Everyone, tell us what you think. Allie, can you describe this gown for us? Mm-hmm. This gown is 1954 by Hubert de Givenchy. It is worn, it was worn by the Duchess of Windsor. It's got like playful monkeys embroidered on uh, ivory, organdy, and chiffon. All right, I'm gonna end this poll. And it looks like Rose is the winner here. What do you think, Allie? We have a lot of smart people, <laughs> a lot of smart fashion. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely a Rose look. Um, yes, it's an A-line, but it's a simple, elegant, Look, you have more muted tones. It is haute couture. It, this screams rose to me. All right, moving on to our next garment. This is our third outfit and who would wear it? And I'm going to start the poll. Who do you think? Allie, what dress are we seeing? We're looking at another Claire McCardle piece. This is a wool red and black red and black plaid McCardle piece with the, it actually has no waist and then the belt cinches it in and it has commercial pleating in it, which was an innovation that McCardle took advantage of. Awesome. And it looks like a large majority of us think that Midge would have worn this if it were featured in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Yep, I think that's perfectly right. It's McCardle, but it's everyday McCardle. It's not like the fancy leisure wear that you would wear in the Catskills. Uh, it's actually similar in shape to the turquoise piece, but the yellow belt, uh, not the McCardle piece, the one that Midge wears in the one scene where I was talking about Dior. It looks like the same silhouette as that. So this is our last who would wear it, and I will launch the poll now. Allie, what gown is this? This is a beautiful blue silk gown. I believe it is made by Hutzlers from mid 1950s. It has this beautiful bow in the middle and lace that you can only see when the cuffs are turned up. All right, I'm gonna end the poll. And once again, we have a resounding majority for Mitch. And I think that is perfectly correct. So not only is this Midge, this is exactly what Midge would wear when she's working at B. Altman's. In fact, the person who wore that blue silk dress was a buyer for Hutzler's, so like a high-end employee at Hutzler's, so it would make sense for Midge. Midge could wear that exact dress in an episode where she's working at B. Altman's on the makeup floor. That's great. Thank you so much. I hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, sorry for the few technical difficulties, um, but that was pretty fun. Well, that wasn't too bad. You all must not be that tipsy. Um, <laughs> I wasn't keeping track of the words, but uh, the ones that you put out at the beginning, I was a little concerned for the audience. <laughs> Claire McCardle probably was a big one. <laughs> um, well, we have a few moments for Allie to answer some of the questions that asked in the Q&A. Um, if you, you still have time to uh, put in your question in that function down there on your screen. The first question comes from um, Alicia. Ali, where can we purchase McArdle inspired designs today? Uh, you have to look usually Etsy or eBay is where you can get some really great vintage fashion. Or if you are in Maryland, you're lucky because we have a really great vintage scene, especially in Baltimore. Uh, I, I highly recommend you look around for some vintage dealers, especially now. Um, they all have a lot online, but you should check out vintage dealers in Baltimore. There's a vintage expo uh, twice a year that hosts a lot of them. They have so much incredible vintage 50s fashion. I think this might have been from one of the uh, Baltimore vintage designers. Uh, Rosemary asks, can you discuss shoes worn on the show? I can. Uh, it would be an entire, another talk. So hats could be a whole talk, purses could be a whole talk, shoes could be a whole talk. Um, there is a really iconic moment in the show when Midge starts working at the Altman. I mean, stilettos come into popularity in the 1950s. 
so you can imagine. I mean, Midge has a bit in her, one of her acts where she talks about how men rule the world because they don't have to wear heels. I mean, women can't even keep up because we're walking in heels. But there's a moment where she works for B. Altman where she has to take off her heels and put on ballet flats. And it's a really poignant moment where she's sitting on a bench in this beautiful dress and she has her flats next to one and then her heels next to her. So it really does send a message. Um, Bonnie is asking, what's the significance of blue? We talked about pink, but what about, is there anything happening with the blue? So whenever Midge is wearing blue or turquoise, I always say my eyebrow goes up. Like something is not right in the world of Midge and it may, it may be that she doesn't know it or it may be that she's mm. something. But I think about when in the scene where she's at the artist studio and she's with Benjamin, um, she's supposed to be almost engaged to this man, but she doesn't really feel it. Uh, and I think that that's why you see her in that color. Uh, you'll also see it, there's the point where she moves into her house with her parents and she's wearing the same color. So you can tell all is not right because she's moving home. And in the flashback, she's wearing that same color and it's supposed to be a happy New Year's Eve. But again, something is not right in the world of Midge because her husband's cheating on her. It's not the perfect happy world. So whenever I see her in blue or teal, like my eyebrow goes up because I know something's shady. That is super interesting. And Ali, is that just that's your um, interpretation of the color blue in this series, or have you um, researched that or heard? Um, so that's the use. That's my take, but Donna Zakaska talks often about the use of color in the show. She talks about how she uses it to give the audience clues. And I'm picking up on trends, but she has been very clear about that. And white, she uses white usually at the end of the season. We saw it season three and season two. It's like a schism in her world where something like something huge has changed. And it also shows her naivete. It's an absence of color, which says a lot. We're going to do, um, I'm going to ask you one more question, Allison. There are several people asking the same question, which is about patterns and where patterns, sewing patterns can be found for any of these designs. Oh, you can find a lot of these uh, patterns still online. I mean, again, the easiest thing to do is, is give it a quick Google because eBay and Etsy have them. I, I think that probably there's some vintage dealers that have them, but you can find some uh, original vintage patterns online. Well, so um, if we didn't get around to answering your question, Allie will answer the rest offline and you will receive them with an email and a video link to rewatch this virtual program next week. We'd really like to thank all of you for joining us today for this special virtual program, um, especially those of you who are members. Um, you're the backbone of this organization and it's because of your support that we're able to produce this type of free virtual programming while we're all social distancing at home. If you're not a member, I hope you'll consider joining with us. We're offering a special membership promotion for new memberships. Um, you can join the Maryland Historical Society as an individual for $25. It's normally 55, or as a family for $35, which is normally 70. Um, membership has many perks, um, including one year of free unlimited access to our museum and research library, as well as by to our biannual publications, discounts in our museum shop, as well as discounts to events and our press publications. And again, within the next few days, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link uh, to this recorded version of the program today. Information also about the Spectrum of Fashion exhibition, which Ali pulled a lot of um, garments from to show you today. Uh, we also will be selling the catalog for the Fashion Spectrum of Fashion exhibit, which includes an essay on Claire McArdle. So those all those links will be available to you um, later when we send out that email. And Martha. Allison and I hope that you enjoyed today's virtual program and consider attending one of our next virtual programs presented by Victoria Pass, Fashion and Crisis, looking to the past to understand how fashion might change in the future. And Victoria is going to be talking with us on Wednesday, May the 20th at noon.
we hope to see you again next time and cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thanks Allie. <laughs> Thank you.